curing the body if in the process you destroy the soul. What do you call a hundred years of saving lives? At City of Hope, we call it a great beginning. We started out in 1913 in two humble tents in Duarte, California. People suffering with tuberculosis came to be treated in the fresh air of the San Gabriel Mountains. They experienced a new level of compassionate care, best expressed in the 1930s by Executive Director Samuel Golder. There is no profit in curing the body if in the process you destroy the soul. In the 1950s, with tuberculosis a thing of the past, City of Hope grew dramatically under the inspired leadership of Ben Horowitz. Known as the Architect of Hope and an advocate for basic research, he helped transform City of Hope into a modern-day medical center dedicated to curing cancer and other life-threatening diseases. That's when the breakthroughs began to happen. Our doctors designed the cobalt bond for treating tumors deep inside the body. It became the prototype for all other hospitals. When word spread of the amazing scientific discoveries going on at City of Hope, famous people came to see and lend their support. This helped raise City of Hope's profile and attract more of the world's finest doctors, scientists, nurses, and caregivers. At City of Hope, we've always felt the urgency to create new drugs and treatments in the fight against cancer and other life-threatening diseases. We have these very brilliant scientists who come up with ideas that are going to have practical applications to patients. We have our own bioproduction facility on campus. We can make all the things that we need to the highest FDA standards. It represents not just good science, but the wedding of good science with good care. physicians and scientists who work here come to work every day to try to do something different than they did the day before. I think patients come here not for standard therapy, but for what is the future of therapy. My laboratory has actually been exploring a number of genetic approaches for treating disease, everything ranging from cancer, to HIV infection and metabolic diseases as well. More than 20 new drugs are a result of research originating at City of Hope, including four of the most frequently used cancer drugs that are saving lives all over the world. The success of City of Hope can best be expressed in human terms, in souls healed and hearts touched. For as long as I can remember, uh, I've known that there's a real relationship between mind and body. It matters to me whether a patient believes they are cared for. There's the story of Hungarian muralist John Burnett, who was treated free of charge at City of Hope. This led to his lifelong commitment, during which he painted the murals of David and Moses that grace our house of hope. I was diagnosed with a grade four glioblastoma, a brain tumor. Dr. Biddy called us at our house and said, I can do this. You know, and <laughs> we just cried. And you come out of buildings and you see the sign that there is always hope and there truly is hope. And every single person there exudes that. John was two and a half when he was diagnosed. Well, the most important thing we got from City of Hope was having John healthy and, and alive and his entire life in front of him. I would describe City of Hope as a place where people go 
for, for treatment and receive care. There are the thousands of survivors who return to City of Hope every year for a joyful reunion that has become so successful it's standing room only. Today we are curing thousands more patients than we did a decade ago. And we're helping tens of thousands more patients than we did. But the work ahead of us is still so great. People want new options, they want better options, they want better treatments and preventions today. But we couldn't have done it alone. For 100 years, fundraising has been the foundation of our success. Good people from all walks of life have stepped up to lend their support. I was 29. Who would have thought with the type of cancer that I had, I had a 5% chance to survive. I have a son. He's two. I know it was because of the City of Hope that I'm here today, six years later. Give me It's been a hundred year legacy filled with pride and accomplishment. And the most exciting thing is, we're just getting started. We have two speakers this evening, Dr. Finley Zachariah and Denise Economo. I hope I'm saying it correctly. Um, let's see, Dr. Finley Zachariah has joined us recently and serves as Assistant Clinical Professor in City of Hope's Department of Supportive Care Medicine. He joins us from Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles Medical Center, where he completed a fellowship in hospice and palliative medicine while concurrently on staff with Intercommunity Emergency Medical Group specializing in urgent care. Dr. Zachariah received his undergraduate degree in cell, molecular, and developmental biology from UC Riverside and earned his medical doctorate from the Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science, Chicago Medical School in Chicago, Illinois. He went on to complete a residency in family tropical medicine at Presbyterian Intercommunity Hospital. Board certified in family medicine, Dr. Zachariah is a member in good standing with several professional organizations, including the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine and the American Academy of Family Physicians. He has volunteered much of his free time assisting those less fortunate living abroad. 
Most recently, he spent a month lecturing and caring for patients in Ethiopia, where he also met with national advisors on enhancing palliative medicine efforts in this country. Trained in both family medicine and palliative care, Dr. Zachariah assists our pediatric and adult patients with their supportive care needs, including pain control, while also helping patients, families, and our physicians with issues surrounding hospice and end-of-life care. Uh, our other speaker tonight is De Denise Economo. And did I say it correctly? Economo. And uh, Denise is someone who's been with City of Hope for many years. Uh, she is a senior research specialist and the project director for survivorship education for quality cancer care. She has been in oncology nursing for 31 years and has focused her clinical expertise and research in pain management, palliative care, and cancer survivorship. Denise is a senior research specialist and the project director for the NCI grant-funded survivorship education for quality cancer care educational program. She's participated in the training of more than 204 teams in survivorship care. Denise lectures to healthcare prof professionals as well as cancer survivors on components of care and survivorship care planning. She is a founding board member of the Southern California Cancer Pain Initiative, as well as an oncology faculty member for the End of Life Nursing Education Consortium. She is past president of the Greater Los Angeles Chapter of the Oncology Nursing Association. She has authored chapters in the Oxford Textbook of Palliative Nursing and Oncology Nursing Advisor. She is an associate editor for the Journal of, an, of the Advanced Practitioner in, in Oncology. So our, you see our experts tonight are very well trained to speak on these topics. And uh, we'd like to call Dr. Zachariah up first. Definitely appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. So I'm just going to be speaking on pain, and, and we'll let the true expert, Denise, over there speak on fatigue and, and uh, chemo brain. Oops. So nothing to disclose from my end, just paid by City of Hope. Uh, as far as the things that we want to cover today, I want to go over just some of the definitions in terms of pain itself, uh, some of the classifications that we typically use. Uh, some of the medications which are potentially unique or, or uh, potentially are, are worrisome to us. Uh, some of the alternatives to quote unquote narcotics and uh, some of the common concerns that patients as well as providers have. So do we need to define pain? You know, we all know what pain is, you know, we've all experienced it. Uh, and Sometimes we just, it's one of those kind of intuitive, obvious things. One of the uh, comedians, Jack Handy, he said in terms of pain and suffering, when I die, I want to go peacefully, like my grandfather did in his sleep, not yelling and screaming like the passengers in his car. Obviously, we want to avoid suffering as much as possible, or if we do have any type of suffering or pain, we want to try and minimize it as much as possible. Does it impact us? Absolutely. The American Pain Society did a survey back in the late 90s and they showed that it affects our sleep, it affects our functionality day to day, it affects our relational capacity, and it affects us emotionally as well. The IASP defined it as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. What does that mean? Really, it means what you say it means. It, it's a very subjective experience. And so this is, this is one of those things where it's not just you have pain, you need to treat it. There's benefits and burdens associated with anything, including the treatments of pain. And if, say, you're a single mother, you have pain, you're going to get a medication which won't allow you to drive, you may decide to change the treatments that you have based off of what you're able to do functionally. One of the founders of the hospice and palliative medicine movement, Dame Cicely Saunders, defined this as total pain. And so she actually kind of brought in the discussion for us saying it's not just the physical pain that we experience, but the psychological, the spiritual, and the social components of our lives which 
also cause pain potentially. Think of psychological. You have a, a child who goes to a pediatrician's office. He gets a vaccine one day. Next time he goes back to that office, he's going to have a bit of psychological pain. He's going to be kicking and screaming and get me out of here, mom, you know. Uh, for social aspects, say you have somebody who, a father figure in the family, larger than life, you know, always looking up to him, always doing amazing things, and then something happens, potentially cancer, potentially something else, and the disease affects him where he now has to have help going to the restroom, taking a shower, doing things which we take for granted. And so that definitely can cause a bit of, of pain. Spiritually, what if great person your whole life and you have now this terrible diagnosis? That may cause some pain as well, spiritually. Where is God in this? You know, why do bad things happen to good people? Those kind of questions are definitely raised. So there's a lot of different pain syndromes. Um, we're going to kind of uh, just... I'll, I'll let you look over those. There's also some uh, pain syndromes related to the treatment itself. And some things like chemotherapy related uh, neuropathies, which can happen. Some of the taxanes may cause that. Say you have corticosteroids, um, which may cause avascular necrosis. Or if you have radiation to various portions of your body, you may have complications related to that as well. Really, when we come to pain, we kind of look at it into these two broad classifications. One is uh, nociceptive pain, and the other is neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is that burning, tingling, shock-like, lancinating, electrical sensation that we sometimes get. Sometimes we experience it as numbness. Hyperalgesia is a fancy word where a painful stimulus is actually more painful uh, than it normally is. And allodynia is an experience which normally doesn't cause pain, say the sheets rubbing over your legs, which for this person is painful now. Nociceptive pain is broken down into two components. One is uh, somatic, which is a sharp, knife-like, localized pain. Say you have abdominal surgery in the um, stomach region, you, you may have uh, pain there, which is, is very well localized. Visceral pain, it refers to a crampy, squeezing, poorly localized uh, pain, typically of the hollow organs. So you're talking about, say, your gallbladder or your colon, uh, one of those types of organs. If you ever had uh, gallbladder, pain, gallbladder pain, cholecystitis, it's uh, pain that's in the right upper quadrant, which then may go to your shoulder, may go to the back. So it, it's not so well localized that you can say, oh, that's exactly where, where that pain is. Bony pain down here is kind of a combination of the two. It has no susceptive and neuropathic components, and usually we need both agents to treat it. Usually that's uh, felt as a constant dull ache, and that also is, is fairly localized as well. Going into some of the agents that we use for pain, acetaminophen or Tylenol is one of the most common. It's available over the counter. I went to the uh, Tylenol.com website and pulled up how many different agents they have. One of the reasons uh, people like this is because it's freely available. You can just go to the grocery store and pick it up, pop a couple tablets, and you know maybe you're, you're feeling a little better. I went to the Mayo website, and they said that Tylenol is the most common cause of acute liver failure in the U.S. So there is a big, big concern with this. And one of the other concerns is that, as you look here, these are a bunch of different drugs which actually have Tylenol in them or acetaminophen in them. So you have things like Norco or Vicodin, which people are familiar with, but people may not realize that it's hydrocodone and acetaminophen. You may have agents like Tylenol-3 with codeine, so the Tylenol you, you uh, see, but there's other agents like MyCoachSleep.com. My coach sleep, no idea that that had acetaminophen in it, but it does. And with all of those agents put together, in a single day, you don't want to be taking more than 3 grams or 3,000 milligrams a day. If you do, that's where there's a potential risk. The FDA, I think, right now uh, has a uh, classification for 4 milligrams per day or 4,000 milligrams per day or 4 grams per day. 
but the expert recommendation of a FDA subpanel uh, had a recommendation to lower it down to three grams. So I definitely recommend anyone who takes acetaminophen or Tylenol to really look at the labels, look for acetaminophen, and try and minimize your use if possible. Another uh, classification of drugs that we use are the may also have some concerns as well. So these may affect your clotting ability or, or how quickly uh, bleeding stops. They may affect uh, your gastrointestinal system, whether you can develop ulcers or not. And it may also potentially cause kidney damage. And so it's very, very important to know how much you're taking, talk to your physicians about it, and let them know as well so that they can tell you what's safe for you or not. Opioids. So a lot of people refer to opioids as narcotics, but narcotics is actually the illegal form. Opioids refer to the legal form of the prescription. So narco, hydrocodone, all those kind of drugs, oxycodone, are what we call opioids, morphine. They're the mainstay of pain management in palliative medicine. A lot of times these drugs cause nausea, they can cause sedation, or they cause itching. But um, these are temporary effects. Usually if you stick with it, within a week or so, they'll go away. The one thing that typically doesn't go away is constipation. I'll just say this is a picture of a bat cave. So. Um, but constipation is one of those things which is always there, always present, and you want to take measures to make sure you get rid of constipation. Uh, some of the things that you can do simply, one of the things is if you don't have a fluid restriction, stay hydrated. Uh, one of the medications that people commonly use is Colase or Docosate. And that works by essentially bulking up the stool. If you don't have enough water, it may have a counter effect and actually uh, cause the constipation to become worse. Um, some other agents that are over the counter are Senna, uh, Cot, which is a stimulant, or Miralax. Miralax is actually a great drug. If you can take uh, fluids, just a capful a day with uh, eight ounces of water, that can definitely help uh, promote bowel movements. Uh, and they've looked at studies looking at patients who have been on it for a long time, over a year, and they haven't found any electrolyte abnormalities. So no changes really in your sodium or your potassium, your magnesium, which you may get from things like magnesium citrate or if you have enemas like the phosphofleet soda enemas that you can get over the counter as well. One of the other big considerations and, and concerns that patients have with opioids is respiratory depression. Uh, can, by taking this medication, will my breathing be knocked out, essentially? There's a fairly defined progression in terms of what happens uh, when you take opioids. And so the problem comes when you're actually taking long-acting medications, not usually when you're taking short-acting medications. So when we say long versus short-acting, things that last for four hours or less, things like Vicodin or uh, oxycodone immediate release, morphine immediate release, those are medications which last for a very short period of time. Usually those may cause some alertness, some confusion, uh, maybe a little drowsiness, sleepiness, and some of those other side effects like I mentioned, the nausea, maybe a little bit itching. Uh, those typically, if you're, if you're starting at a, a low dose, which physicians will uh, prescribe for patients who have not been on it before, uh, you'll just stop there. But if you take a long-acting medication, which may last for 8 to 12 to 7 to 12 to the form of it, that can definitely take somebody through this progression. And once a patient is in a coma, if they keep on getting medications, that's when the respiratory drive is really affected and when you can get into serious trouble. So worry, but not as much. What's a slide about insulin doing up here? Yeah, we, City of Hope was, was instrumental in, in helping with insulin. But this is actually a great analogy for pain. Essentially, you know, we just talked about long-acting medications causing all this trouble. Maybe we should avoid long-acting medications. Maybe we should just stick with the Norco and the immediate release morphines and the immediate release oxycodones. But that's actually not really great management of pain if you have pain for a long period of time. Uh, this, so as I said, this is a, a graph of your sugar levels and, and what happens when patients have diabetes with insulin. 
So usually what happens is you have some level of sugar which is in your system all day long and when you eat typically you'll get spikes of sugar rising in your blood. So the best management for diabetes typically is you have a long-acting medication which helps take care of all this baseline noise down here and then you have short-acting insulins which help take care of the peaks of sugar which uh, are caused by your meals or snacks or things like that throughout the day. Same thing with pain. A lot of patients who have pain may have some underlying baseline pain or, or small amounts of pain which are, are there. And the long-acting medications really help to kind of calm that down for people. Where you want to use the immediate release medications is when you have those spikes of pain. And that's where you can uh, basically prevent it and use less of your short actings per day. Ideally, if patients are on a good regimen, usually they're only taking two to three short acting pills and the rest of the pain is covered throughout the day by long acting medications. Some other problems that happen with opioids. So abuse. This is a huge, huge concern. Um, basically, among the children as well. There is some studies, and this is off of the, uh, the ONDCP website, and basically what they said was among 12th graders, pharmaceutical drug use non-medically, six out of the 10 most common drugs were pharmaceutical drugs. So huge, huge problem. Another one was that 29% of people aged 12 or older who used illicit drugs used prescription drugs non-medically for the first time in the past year. So that was, that's huge as well. And so there's a, a big, big responsibility to try and protect against that abuse occurring in our schools and, and uh, for patients and families as well. There was a uh, uh, website which is put out by the government to kind of help educate teens and, and young adults on this as well. And so it's PeerRx. Uh, if you type in into Google and you can find that and, and it helps kids understand what are the different types of drugs that are out there, what are they appropriately used for, how do you uh, help resist against peer pressure and, and things of that nature. Uh, in terms of what you can do personally if you have opioids, how, how do you keep yourself, how do you keep your family and, and uh, friends safe as well? So this was put out by the American Academy of Pain, and they recommended eight different things that people should always do. So never take a prescription pain medication unless it's prescribed for you. You know, how many, how many of us have been given an antibiotic by our parents? Oh yeah, you know, we have a little bit left in the medicine cabinet, you have a little bit of a cough and a cold, let's give you a little bit of medication. Don't do that, not a good idea. Um, same thing as never adjust your own doses. Oh, you know, I have a little bit of pain, the doc gave me two pills, I think five pills may work better. Not a good idea with opioids. Never mix with alcohol and combining with sedatives can be dangerous. As we had said, one of the side effects of opioids is sedation. If you mix it with alcohol or other sedatives, they can, that effect can be additive. So that's another huge concern. The other, another interesting fact is actually patients who have been on opioids for a while, they've actually studied it. So you take a person, they, they've done test scores, uh, driving reaction times, and they've looked at that. They've put them on opioids, and then they retest them in a month and three months. And by about a month, month and a half, patients who have been on a stable dose of opioids, you haven't really changed your dose, you've been consistent. The reaction, driving times, test taking skills, all those things actually go back to normal as if you were never on the drugs in the first place. And so just to illustrate the point, as I was saying earlier, a lot of those side effects except for constipation go away over time. The other thing is always tell your healthcare provider about all the medications you're taking, whether that's herbal supplements or the Tylenol or the ibuprofen or other things that you get over the counter, absolutely important to let them know. There may be interactions that uh, you may not be aware of. Keep track of when you take all your medications. So if you know how many pills uh, you're taking of Norco or some other medication, it's definitely going to help your providers change things in a safe manner for you. If you're like, ah, I take two one day, I take ten the other day, I don't know, I'm in pain and I just pop some pills. That's not unfortunately helpful for the physicians to safely adjust your medications. Um, the other thing too, just as we talked about abuse, keep your medications locked up in a safe place. 
So sometimes what happens is, you know, Johnny and his friends are coming over, they're visiting grandma's house, they go to the restroom, they look in the medicine cabinet, hey, what's this bottle? Maybe let me take a couple of these pills and I can try it with my friends later. Obviously not something that we want to happen, but it does happen. And that's sometimes how these gateway medications cause worse problems later on for illicit drug abuse. Finally, dispose of any unused medications. Some, this can be done by taking your medications to the pharmacy. Um, sometimes they talk about mixing it in with uh, noxious chemicals like bleach or coffee grounds or something like that, putting it in a bag and throwing it out, usually not dumping it down the toilet. I guess that's um, getting into the environmental system and the water beds and all that kind of stuff, and so you don't want to deal with that. Um, other considerations, neuropathic pain. So we don't just have medications at our disposal to help uh, with pain. Sometimes things like even vaccines can help to reduce pain. So PHN stands for post-herpetic neuralgia. Patients who have had uh, Zostra vaccine, they've actually had a decreased incidence of this. So that's a huge benefit that patients can get. The other thing too is you should use the right medications for the right indication. Opioids are great, but as a standalone medication for neuropathic pain, they've actually been shown to over time cause worse pain. If opioids are the only thing you're using for neuropathic pain, it may not be the best idea. And so a lot of times we have what we call adjunctive medications or add-on medications to this. Sometimes these add-on medications may not work immediately. A lot of times people are like, well, I take the Norco and I feel the effects in an hour. And I take my nortriptyline at bedtime and I don't feel anything different. Sometimes these medications take a couple weeks, maybe a month, to actually build up to appropriate levels and really start changing how uh, the brain processes those nervous chemicals and the nerve pain. So when should I take my pain medications? I think a lot of patients tell me, at the very, very last minute, I can tough it out. Uh, you don't know the pain that I've been able to handle in my life, doc. You know, I, I'm, I'm a tough guy, and I don't want to be on these, on these medications. So a lot of times, patients will wait till this stage. And if you think of your pain medications like a bucket of water, it's unfortunately not going to do too much good. I'd prefer my patients think of pain like this, single match, but it's going to get explosive and very hot very quickly. So you better take care of better take care of better take care of better take care of better take for their stage. But doc, I don't want to get addicted. So there's there's a few different things that I'd like to briefly touch on. One thing that happens when any patient is on opioids is dependence. If you've been on a medication for a while, then your body gets used to it. If you stop it suddenly, you can go through withdrawals. That's not addiction, that's dependence. And that is very, very normal. What happens if you take something like over-the-counter Sudafed? If you've used it for a few days, more than that, you can actually get what we call rebound hypertension. Your body gets used to it, and you have a, a reaction to it. Tolerance is the phenomenon where slowly over time, a certain amount of medication may have a lesser effect than when it did when you initially started the drug. And that sometimes is normal, but it usually it takes a very, very long time for that to happen. Addiction is the phenomenon where your pain is completely well controlled, but after that point, you're still craving the medication, you're still desiring it, you're still trying to find ways to potentially hoard it or get it otherwise. And so addiction is a thing that I think 90% of my patients come to my office saying, I don't want that medication, doc, because I don't want to get addicted. I don't even want, to, even want to have the possibility of getting addicted. Most of my patients who are scared are probably not in the classification of people who are going to ever get addicted. So uh, what non-medication options do you have? There's a lot of things that we offer here at City of Hope. The ones in bold, I think, are um, the ones I believe are, are the ones that we offer. Massage, I think, is, is going to be offered in March. In addition to some of the complementary therapies that uh, we have and, and they have around the country, there's also classes that they have, educational, uh, which sometimes helps patients as well. And non-medication-wise, there's also a lot of other things that they can do. So there's interventional procedures that may be beneficial for the right patient. Say there's some type of neuropathic pain which may benefit from a nerve stimulator. Um, or 
potentially a pump or, or something else. So there, there are other options that, that we have. This is an example of uh, art therapy. So just to uh, conclude, it's definitely uh, been a huge honor just to be here for the short time I have at City of Hope. And a couple quotes that I've liked is one from Julius Caesar. It is easier to find men who will volunteer to die than find those who are willing to endure pain with patience. Huge problem, got to treat it, got to take care of it. Let's try to nip it in the butt as soon as possible. Uh, another from Albert Schweitzer, we must all die, but if I can save him from days of torture, that is what I feel is my great and ever new privilege. Pain is a more terrible lord of mankind than even death itself. So another illustration of huge problem, and, and I'm just glad to help ease the suffering here at City of Hope. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. This is the first time I got to hear Finley speak, and I'm really glad he's with us. I'm really thrilled. So I get to talk about fatigue and cognitive um, changes, and I think most of us in this room have experienced this, either if you're a survivor or if you're uh, a middle-aged woman who's lost her estrogen. So we'll talk about all of these things, I hope, and then we'll get a chance to do some questions and answers. This program nothing to, 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 to tell you about. I have no money coming in from somebody that I'm going to support through this talk. But I also want to let you know that we're also going to talk about cognitive changes. So we'll think it's not just about fatigue. But we'll look at some strategies and think about how we might manage it better. So we like to define things so that we all know that we're all talking about the same thing. So when we talk about fatigue, we define it as distressing, persistent, subjective sense of tiredness or exhaustion, and related to cancer, cancer treatments. So it's not proportional to your recent activity, and it interferes with usual functioning. So a lot of you may say, you know, I sleep and I wake up and I'm just as exhausted, right? Or your caregiver, your partner says, I don't understand it. She sleeps all the time. Why is she tired? Because they don't understand that this fatigue is different. So that's what we want you to help you understand so you can tell people when you can't do things that you'd like to do. So if we look at it as usual, abnormal, excessive, whole body tiredness, so it's really disproportional to what's going on in your life. Maybe you're not doing anything, but you're exhausted. So it has a profound negative impact, and you can see how this kind of goes with pain management as well. These are things that we really want to manage well for our patients because it does affect your quality of life. And that's what we're here for. We want to improve quality of life. So I wanted you to see this. So these are some of the things, and I don't know, you think about how you describe it bone tired, that's an old saying that we used to say and people would think, what does that mean? But if you think about it, you're just so tired. So those are things that we wanna think about it, the week, how it makes you feel unable to take care of yourself and so normal functioning changes, which affects a lot of the other things. Like when, when Finley talked about pain being a whole experience, whole body, that's a big part of what we do in nursing research here. We have a quality of life model, and it's the physical, psychological, social, and spiritual pieces, because all of those domains come together to give you quality of life. And if we all think about areas that are affected for us, and how, and they are different, and that's the, you're a moving target for us. If we could manage everybody the same way, we would be fabulous, wouldn't we? But we can't, because everybody responds differently. Everybody has different needs. We can have a patient that's in agony. They, they appear to be suffering so horribly. And until we really assess that patient, we find out that it's not physical pain at all. That it may be something existential, something spiritual, some feeling that they need to, to get off their chest, and that will relieve the pain. So pain is different for other people and just as fatigue is. So we want to understand what is it that you're feeling. So it's complex, we know that. It's a subjective experience. So like I said, fatigue to one person is different than fatigue to someone else. So it includes that subjective experience and objective performance. So for us in healthcare, we may say, well, are you able to, to go from your bed to the bathroom? Are you able to walk to the car? Can you go to the mailbox? So those are, so those are really objective things that we can use to measure what's going on. But we like to know that what you feel, what does it feel like for you? We know that attentional fatigue is a big problem. And in nursing, unfortunately, when we're giving our chemotherapy education to patients and you've been overwhelmed with being told that you have cancer or you're going to have to have this treatment and it's going to last every three weeks times six, 
cycles or, and, and you're getting all this information and we're bombarding you. In the old days, you know, we're thinking as nurses, we've got to get this all done because we want you to come in for your first appointment and be ready. But what we're not thinking about is you, you're not taking it in. So that's why so many times we'll tell you, bring a friend, let's tape this, we'll give you handouts, because we know you're not getting it all at that same time. And for some people, that diagnosis, at diagnosis is when you're most fatigued. It's fatigue that brought you to the doctor. So we want to talk about some of those things. So we know that fatigue can be acute, short-lived, it can be chronic, it can be long-term. It can be attentional and it can be neuromuscular, meaning you don't have the energy to lift your arms up. So we want to talk about that. So failure to maintain that force. And if you think about what it takes to lift a can, to open a door, you have to have that strength to do it. So it may feel fatigued because you can't do it, but it may be neuromuscular. So we may look at some of those things. Again, it's often the first symptom that brings patients to the doctor. So many of my lung cancer patients, that's what started it. They were so fatigued and didn't understand it. It was so different from their normal way of functioning that it really made them think, what is wrong? I need to go find out. So we also have to look at 40% of patients report fatigue at diagnosis. 40%, that's a lot. 70 to 100% is related to disease or treatment, and we know that their symptoms during cancer and treatment change. So we want to look at that. We also know that we've done, made some big changes. Nausea and vomiting used to be a much bigger problem in my early days of nursing. As Suze points out, I was an old, I'm an old nurse, and you know, I remember holding those buckets or giving patients you know, trash can liners to go get in the car to go home because I knew they were going to throw up before they got there. But we don't have to do that anymore. We've made such progress, and we're so excited about it. So that's where we're looking now at really improving fatigue. And thanks to studies, we've been able to find some things that may be helpful. And I'll share those. So again, 80 to 100% of patients who are receiving chemotherapy will feel fatigued. We also know that it occurs in 40 to 90% of radiation oncology patients. And what happens in oncology is many of like my breast cancer patients will say, I feel great, I can do what I want to do, I don't have a problem. And then as they keep going through radiation and get further and further along, they get more tired and more tired and more tired because it's cumulative. So they don't understand it. But for chemotherapy patients, it's usually when their counts drop after their chemo, they drop, they get really tired and fatigued, and then as their counts come back up, the fatigue lessens. So we get a different cycle depending on what your treatment regimen is. Again, what does it do? It seriously compromises your quality of life, and that's something we want to make a difference for. So there's other symptoms that can provide or can go along with causing that fatigue. So we want to look at that. Depression, unrelieved pain. So even if you're trying to be stoic and really tough it out, you're exhausting yourself and you're making it much more difficult for us to manage those symptoms. Think about it. When your mood is depressed, you're tired, right? You don't want to do anything. Well, it may not be a physical fatigue, but it's an, a mental, an emotional fatigue and it's fatiguing. So regardless of what you want to say the cause is, it still causes that. Looking at concentration, so again, when we talk about cognitive changes, concentration is really affected, and it can be very, very fatiguing. So thinking about that, what you do as a job, what is your work, what are you doing, what are your roles, your relationships, what's your daily life like, what do you like to do? Those are the things that matter. So that's what we look at. Now, Philly didn't talk about this, but I love to make sure you understand what zero to 10 means, because I know you get sick of it, right? Oh, here they go, they're gonna ask me, rate your pain, rate your fatigue. All those things are really important because we can't help you if we don't understand what's going on. And I just told you that it's really subjective. So if I ask you, how bad is your fatigue? Zero is no fatigue, 10 is the worst fatigue you can imagine. I need to understand because it's your fatigue. I need to understand. It's like in pain, I'll say to patients, zero to 10. And a lot of patients don't get it for pain. And they'll say, well, I'll say zero is no pain, 10 is the worst pain you can imagine. And I don't know what it is about California, but everybody likes to think the worst pain they can imagine is a shark bite. They'll, I'll say sh shark bite. And they go, oh, I get it. And I think, now, have you ever been bitten by a shark? I don't think so, but that's what we think of. Now, if you're a woman, then you think of childbirth. But think about how you're going to rate it. So every one of us has to think about it in our own way. But really try to put a number on it because it helps us. It helps us so much when we know what we're dealing with. 
So what causes cancer-related fatigue? We're not really sure. There's a lot of different reasons that could be causing it. We know there's physiologic changes, central and peripheral fatigue. We know that inflammation can cause a lot of fatigue in a patient. So we want to look at that. We know metabolic byproducts, and we know anemia. So we used to push anemia a lot in the old days, and we realized that it really didn't make that much of a difference. It does help, and you know when your counts are low how tired you feel, and it does make a difference. Hydration is really helpful, too, so we know that. And that's when Finley's talking about how, much, how important being hydrated is for a lot of different reasons. I just forgot to tell you, Finley, you know what my title is? The Bowel Queen, because I've never met a bowel I couldn't move. I just wanted to make sure he knew who to call. Uh, physio physiological perspectives, again, depression and anxiety. So this slide is way too much for you to look at. But what it does is help me also think about what's going on. So pro-inflammatory cytokines, we know now as we look at, at um, research in that and how it affects cognitive changes as well. We know about cachexia and tissue fading and, and all of these things that really the catabolism and serotonin. We know about a lot of different things that can be contributing to fatigue. So as we look more into this research and have other ways to manage it, we now know how to look at things. You know, we may give testosterone to some people to help kind of raise the hormones to help them have more energy. So we will look at things. The anemia hypothesis is still there, and it makes sense. When your counts are low, you have less blood to carry oxygen around, right? And less oxygen means you're sleepy, you're tired. So we think about that. So deep breathing can really be helpful. Think about it. And then looking at some other energy sources that really affect skeletal muscle. So that's what we're thinking about. Again, pain, we know, contributes to fatigue. We know emotional distress, sleep disturbance, big changes in sleep. I'll talk about that today. We all had a big lecture about that um, this afternoon. Nutritional deficiencies, heart functioning changes. How many of you have irregular heartbeats? Anybody have it? Are you on medicines for things like that? That can be very fatiguing because it also makes you short of breath too, doesn't it? So you can see how oxygen plays a big role in this. Physical inactivity, and you're all looking at me like, oh right, yeah, I'm going to really feel like running a marathon. But you need to do some activity. I don't care if it's a lot, if it's just walking from your house to your mailbox and back, you've got to make yourself do something. Um, sometimes when we had patients in the old days in transplant, we kept them in the hospital for over a month, and in their room we would give them soup cans. And they would sit in the chair while we changed the bed and just lift the soup cans a couple times. Each time I'd get them out of the bed, and it was just to keep them moving. You know, there's a great ad that talks about a body in motion stays in motion. That's the truth. you got to keep moving. So that's our goal. Well, how do we manage fatigue again? We did put some great, helpful, I hope they're helpful to you, um, patient education things in your, in your binders or in your little um, folders. And these are things that we've built up over time with our research and nursing research. So we've developed these to help patients. And you'll find them on the floors, too. We have them all up in the little holders on the floors. There are all kinds of them to help with different things. So we're really looking at ways we can help. We want to increase physical activity. We want to counter that. Um, that function, so the idea is that we increase your functioning, we keep you mobile, we keep things, the joints moving, that's important. This looked at a six week supervised exercise program, it was a study recently done in just 2012, and how it really reduced cancer related fatigue by improving physical and mental functioning. I'm thinking about that functional capacity, your, your ability to get up and walk and move. So we really want to prove it. We know acupuncture can help, and we know that relaxation, visualization can improve fatigue. So when you go over to the center, the Biller Center, and do some of these things and learn how to do some of these relaxation things, you can really help yourself improve fatigue, which is a good thing. Because when I was nursing early in our early days, we didn't like to ask patients how tired they were because they'd tell us and we couldn't do anything about it. So now it's exciting because we do have some ways of looking at it and ways we can think about how to improve it. Well, I'm moving quick, aren't I? I'll slow down here. Memory and concentration. I want you to think about now what cognitive impairment or cognitive dysfunction, you'll hear things saying, people say chemo brain, and they'll talk about, I don't understand, I'm fuzzy. How many of you have experienced some of that chemo brain fu fuzziness? Yeah, it seems to be pretty, pretty um, um, something that's really experienced by a lot of our patients. So it may include memory loss, trouble paying attention, trouble finding the right word. We find that a lot. Difficulty with new learning. So again, when we're trying to teach you ways to manage your health, 
It's hard to pay attention to it if you're feeling some of these symptoms. And then managing your daily activities. So that's executive functioning. You're not alone, we just showed you. So the thing that we know that may cause some of that is low blood counts. We know that stress. How many of you, when you're really stressed, find you can't find your keys, you can't remember things because you're confused, you, know, you just, stress is not good. So we really want to help you with that. If you're depressed, we know that you're going to have trouble remembering things, thinking. If you're anxious, so look at that. Fatigue and sleep disturbances. We know that you need to sleep at least eight hours a day. It really does make a difference. So we want you to really get yourself, just like we used to do with our kids, you got to go to sleep at the same time and get up at the same time every day. It's really important to keep that sleep cycle going. That's when your, your body gets a chance to kind of rejuvenate. So think about that. Again, what's genetic makeup for you? Are you someone who's at risk for Alzheimer's or some other confusion or, or cognitive change? So those are things that we now recognize we have to take into account with patients because if we don't think about that, we may be try, trying to treat something that we think is chemotherapy related that isn't. So we want to really understand what's going on. Uh, Pro-inflammatory cytokines, like I talked about for fatigue, are really a big, a big um, culprit in causing some confusion. And we want to look at that. Normal aging, like I said, and medications used to treat side effects. So what was one of the first things we talked about with opiate use? You're going to get sedated. You're going to get a little sleepy. And so that can get really frustrating. And a lot of my patients, if that interferes with their activities of daily living, if that interferes with their ability to get up and get themselves moving, they won't take their pain medicine. But that's why we were trying to tell you that you've got to give us a chance, because within 72 hours, you usually will develop a tolerance to that sedation effect. So think about that. It's worth doing. If you're feeling better so that the, the big picture is going to be better quality of life because your pain's relieved, which means you're going to exercise, right? You're going to get up and walk. You're going to eat, right? You're going to drink that fluid we want you to drink. That's important. So think about how we can balance it. But we've got to understand what you're taking to understand what else is contributing to this. Again, hormonal changes. We know that menopause makes a big difference. Lack of estrogen, androgens in men with prostate cancer. When we take away your testosterone, it changes things. So we know how we can try to help work around that so we can get you going in the right direction and feeling better, like you're able to, to think and do things. Again, most patients experience it at baseline. So their first treatment, they may experience it, and 20% only have a longer than, than just acute response. So you may do it initially. The problem is I can't tell you which patient's going to have a longer, a longer time of confusion than another one. We know that as you get a course of chemotherapy and may have a little bit and then you have time off and then your next course of therapy, that it may contribute to it growing a little bit more. So we're going to wait and really kind of try to understand what's happening after you finish your chemo. If you're getting radiation to the brain, it makes sense you're going to get sleepy, you're going to get a little confused. Sometimes you get a little swelling, a little pressure, and it changes things. So we're going to watch that and just balance it out until it gets better. So the thing we want you to remember is don't give up the ship and think that you're going to be confused for life. It's not going to work. Now, you can be confused conveniently when you want to be, so that's always a good thing. You can kind of say, I didn't remember that. Oh, you know, got to forgive me, and they will. So think about that. And now we know there's another study that was done looking at Brain stimulation, so again, remember Sudoku and everybody gets these things and gets math going, I'm terrible in math. The only math I cared about was how to calculate an IV. Drops, you know, that's all I cared about. So it scares me, but now I get Sudoku, it really makes you think and keep your brain. Now the studies aren't as wonderful as I thought they should be over this, but we do know that it does help to keep you thinking. And all of you know, you remember the grandfather, the grandmother you had that was really active, read the newspaper every day, stayed active? They did well for a long time. So it's true. When you, when, and that's what happens when we retire sometimes. We don't stay as stimulated as we should. So read that book. Think about things. Really, I mean, I don't know if politics will make, get your pressure up or not, but I mean, it makes you think. You have to calculate and you have to balance things. So think about that. So looking at this training program that really worked about memory and attention adaptation training was a really a combination of, of exercises, of relaxation, of visualization. So it's a combined effort. So that's why you'll see us offering classes and all these different things, because it's not just one thing that makes it better. I wish it was. So we have to think about how to 
combine things. But don't, consume, don't assume your chemo brain is going to last forever. It isn't necessarily, but we're going to look. If you're older and healthy, but you're exercising and you're doing things, we're going to look at things to make sure Alzheimer's isn't part of this. We're going to make sure we can help you do that. So what we're looking at, though, is improving your quality of life and improving your function. So that's what we're looking, helping you make healthy living choices, getting enough rest, like I talked about, eating a healthy diet, getting the fluids that you need, and psychological and emotional support may be beneficial. We have lots of wonderful social workers in this institution. Talk to them. They might be able to help relieve some of the stressful things you're dealing with so that you can keep your function focused on what you want to focus on. That's important. So we want to tell us what's going on because we can't help you if we don't know what you're experiencing. Really important. So we want to establish some concentration, right? So these are some exercises you can think of. So you want to be aware of distractions. What is it? And use some thought stopping, refocus. When you start to get carried away and you're not thinking like you should, stop yourself and make yourself really do it. We used to teach patients to carry, to put rubber brands around their wrist. So when they were going off in this weird thought process, they snapped themselves. And then that makes them kind of wake up and stay forward. So we had, I mean, I, we weren't really kind of mean, I guess, but the patient did it. We didn't stop them with it, but it helped them kind of stay focused. So carry a pad and pencil. How many of you think about that? Sometimes you think, if I could just write this down. It's true. Write it down because then your brain is not focusing on trying to remember it. Write it down. Do a list. That will really help you. We want to help you increase your concentration. My mom used to always say that to me when she wanted me to remember something. She'd say, lock it in, lock it in. So think about that. You want to, if there's something really important that you need to remember, lock it in. Focus on it, stay focused on it. Write it down. That's a good thing. I like to keep a pad and pencil by my bedside because I don't know how many times if you're like me, you wake up and you're thinking about things you need to do or you're ruminating on something else. Write it down. Then you can go to sleep because then you can think, okay, I'll, I'll take care of it tomorrow. I'll remember. So that's important. Highlight the important stuff. That's important. Think about what really matters to you. Stay focused on that. Let the other stuff go. Take a break. Sometimes we're so busy, so busy, you... And it, Driving out to City of Hope, if you don't live close to it, is tough. And by the time you get here, you're exhausted again. And then we're going to do these things. So if you need to, we have gorgeous grounds. Walk around the Rose Garden. Take a break. Then you can stay focused again. And remember to stop us. If we're giving you too much at, the, at once and you're having problems really focusing, tell us, slow down, give me a break, and then come back and talk to me again. I can't remember this. And we'll do that but let us know what's happening. Vary your activities. Do you find when you do the same thing over and over and over again, it could get kind of down there, right? You get kind of sleepy, you kind of lose your concentration. I'm Catholic, so I do rosaries, and sometimes I think I have to ask for forgiveness because I'm falling asleep doing that rosary, and I think, I gotta change this up a little bit. I gotta do something different. So think about it, vary your activities. Develop a concentration habit, okay? How long can you go? When are you at your best? That's the important thing. Think about when you're the most alert. I'll have family members say, we're going to have a birthday party for mom. We're going to do a dinner. And I think, she's exhausted at bedtime. And I'll talk to them and say, what about a brunch? What about something? Think about what's the best time of day when you're most awake. That's when you want to plan things. That's when you want to plan to meet your friends for lunch or dinner, depending on what time you're awake. So think about that. Help yourself to have a real positive outcome, and that's key. I say to my patients all the time, I want you to make three lists. I want you to make a list of things that only you can do, and it doesn't have to have laundry on it. Only you can do. Things that you can delegate to someone else, and things that make you happy. That's your third list. And I tell my patients I want them to do something from that third list every day. Something that makes you happy, because that's important. And that's what's going to give you the quality of life. But I want you to help us. We can't help you if we don't know what's going on. And quality of life is our goal. This is City of Hope. Our patients come here with hope. So we want to give you the best quality of life we can. And we really appreciate it when you help us out with that. So I just have one last thought. <clears throat> I'm only one, Helen Keller, and I loved it. I want you to think about what you can do, right? I'm only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. I will not refuse to do the something I can do. 
So that's my goal to get you moving, right? So I want you to think about goals you can do and do them. That's important. So I think we're going to do questions and answers. I'm going to leave my little poem up, okay? Uh, yeah, they want you to write them in cards, but we'll take questions. Come on, Finley. You're the doctor. We need you up here. Oh, no, I'm, I'm fine. I... Oh, wow. Yeah. You want to me to read your question? Oh, you want to see? Thank you. So if you just read the question. This is a good question. So I can speak on there later. I'm going to be asking about the testosterone. Uh, Okay. I can answer. Yeah, it's your baby. Mm -hmm. Read your question first. You want me to do it first or you want to? I'm um, sure. I think pain's a big thing. I'll talk okay. more about pain. Sounds good. Okay. So uh, one of the first questions that we had was, what can you say about Lyrica for neuropathy? So Lyrica is a medication which is, uh, that's a trade name for pregabalin. And uh, the generic for that, or, or the uh, precursor drug for that, is gabapentin or neurontin. So we actually use it all the time. Um, usually we'll start patients off with uh, gabapentin or neurontin, and we kind of keep going up on that as patients tolerate it. Usually if we uh, start slow and, and we keep on going up, uh, most patients are able to tolerate it. If we get to high doses and for some reason there's either uh, problems processing the medication or something else, Lyrica is a good drug to switch to. Lyrica is, in a sense, the already processed form of Neurontin or Gabapentin. So great drug. We use it all the time. Can I, re I want to just reinforce what he said during the lecture because patients all the time think it, this doesn't work because they want it to work like a pain medicine. And he's right. It's, we always start low, go slow, so we've got to titrate it. So you've got to bear with us. And I always used to tell patients when the nurse would get them with the prescription is say, now we're going to start with, you know, 10 milligrams or, and we're going to build up 20, 30. We want, you know, it'll be three times a day. Then it'll be, you know, 60, you know, we, 300. I mean, we get it up 300, 900. We get it up high. So, so stick with us because it is, it does help. Not as great sometimes as we wish, but yeah. it's what we got, and it works better than what we used to do, which we used to do is put you on a PCA pump of an opiate, and all you would do is sleep. Yeah, and, it's not and helpful. with that, just to, just to add on, we'll start with, say, 300 milligrams once a day at bedtime. Usually the uh, studies kind of show that the effective dose is around 900 milligrams, and so we take usually over about a week to get there. Um, if you're more uh, seasoned in age, uh, more, more refined, sometimes we'll start with a little bit lower doses and, and we'll uh, usually get to the most effective dose at that point. But it's only once you get to that effective dose that there's a delay in time before it starts uh, affecting you and before you start feeling the effects of it. There's more about um, finger tingling, numbness, numbness and tingling. It kind of goes with that. Okay, yeah, so a couple other questions. What can be done to help alleviate numbness or tingling? And so in, in that regard as well, it depends on, once again, the benefits and burdens of treatment. If it's a little bit of tingling, it's not bothering you to a great extent, perhaps you don't need to do anything for it at all. If it's causing pain or if it's causing discomfort in any way, then it may be something to treat. And so uh, with that, there is the gabapentin, like I said, the Lyrica. If those fail, there are other medications that we can use. Sometimes, say, uh, patients have uh, peripheral neuropathy of their feet or their heel or something like that. Sometimes a topical medication like a lidoderm patch or a lidocaine 
uh, jelly, which is a numbing medication, can definitely help to alleviate the pain. So there's, there's definitely a number of, of things that we can do, but it really is, is kind of based on uh, the cause and, and ramping up slowly. Start slow, start with the most effective dose, and then go up from there if it's not working. Sure. Uh, so the next uh, question, which is slightly different, is what about the use of marijuana to ease pain and other side effects? So marijuana is one of those medications. It's federally illegal. But at the same time, uh, in California, you can actually uh, get it legally. Um, so you can, you're not allowed to have it in federal facilities, Medicare-funded facilities like City of Hope. You're not supposed to have it on campus but a physician can provide a recommendation for it. It is a medication which is indicated sometimes for pain, uh, neuropathic pain. Sometimes it's also indicated for appetite stimulation. And where other medications may not work, sometimes marijuana does. But it is one of those medications which uh, can cause some cognition problems, and that has definitely been seen, and it's, it's fairly well known. And so if we can use the other medications, which are more well-tried, more tested, doesn't have as much of a uh, social stigma associated with it, I'll definitely prescribe those medications first. If they don't work, then usually I'm okay with uh, giving my patients a referral. And it's, it's only a recommendation you then have to take it with the release of your medical records to the California State Department. You can get a medical marijuana ID card, and then at that point, you can access some of the dispensaries and things like that and, and get marijuana in, in various forms, um, from smoking to brownies to different forms of it that they If that you have a have. teenage son, they know exactly how to get it. <laughs> Maybe not from the medical marijuana dispensaries. <laughs> It's, it's amazing how you fight for your patients, and then you hear these kids, and you're like, I don't get it. Yeah. Do you want to talk? Someone's asked about um, prostate cancer and um, provigil, which I think is really helpful for that fatigue. Yeah, so um, provigil is, is definitely one of those medications which we use. So for uh, fatigue, definitely agree with everything that uh, Denise said. It is one of those medications which we usually start fairly low. Um, the other part of the question was how much. So if you look at children who have ADHD, um, that's, that's where most people see Ritalin and, and things like that, and they usually have a negative association. They're like, these kids are bouncing off the walls, they're wired, and we give them Ritalin, and then they calm down. Why are you going to give me a medication that causes kids to calm down? So it, it actually has a separate effect in most adults, and uh, usually we'll start with doses much lower than those that are used in children. So children will start with somewhere around like 30 twice daily, I believe, and we'll start maybe five twice daily in, in adults, usually fairly early in the morning. Sometimes the side effects that is insomnia or other things, and, and uh, by start, um, starting the medications in the morning and keeping it early in the day, you don't have as much of that, and it'll give you more energy throughout the day. Yeah, it could be really helpful, whoever asked that question. And the nice thing about Provigil is it works rather quickly, so it's one of the few drugs we can give you that you can actually see if you get benefit, and that's important. Can I ask you to talk about, there's many more things going on here. Um, what would cause leg weakness so severe to render someone incapable of walking? It is, is it radiation, chemo, or side effects of opiates such as morphine? But the key is he had 10 radiation treatments to his spine. So it's not probably the medicine. Yeah. So that, that's, I think this is probably getting more to a, a uh, case-specific uh, question, which I, Maybe whoever asked this, we can, we can definitely talk online, uh, offline afterwards. Um, but it, it's really hard to say, and, and it would be depending on looking at what happened, what type of cancer, what the studies show, um, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and sometimes there are multiple factors which uh, play a role in, in terms of causing weakness. Yeah, so. that's, that's an important thing. We've got lots of questions. Um, talking about side effects of chemo, what side effects do they cause and are they painful? It depends on, it may have something to do with where the tumor is and what's happening as things shrink away from the tumor as it shrinks. That can cause pain. Normally, chemotherapy isn't painful when it's being administered unless 
it's the IV that's painful or you have some burning or, or pain at the site. I can't think mm -hmm. of anything that's chemo painful, unless you've gotten things that are sensitive to heat or cold, and those can be painful and uncomfortable if you experience that with your medicine. That's the only thing that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, or like chemotherapy induced, like the, the toxins, like I had mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, you can get Neuropathy. neuropathies, things like that, which may occur from, from them. And usually improve over time as you get further away from the chemo. You want to go ahead? Um, still. Okay. Trying to filter through these questions. Um, what are the benefits of steroids? Are they necessary? And what if chemo did not include steroids? Yeah, so um, steroids definitely can uh, be beneficial as well. So ProVigil is one of those things that wake people up, give people energy. Uh, steroids also can do the same thing. But steroids also have potential complications with them. And so usually, if possible, we don't like to use steroids for any long period of time. Uh, some of the complications, depending on the type of steroid, is, is it can affect uh, your adrenal cortical system. Sometimes it can cause uh, swelling, can cause um, what we call adrenal insufficiency. So there, there may be uh, complications in, in that regard. You can get uh, weight gain. You can get muscle atrophy. Uh, and so for patients who are trying to be functional, who are trying to uh, live as active a life as possible, you may get an energy burst with the steroids, but then if your muscles are atrophying or they're uh, shrinking in a sense, then you may not be able to be as active. You may be awake, but you may be weaker than when you had started the medication. And so it's good potentially for short bursts. Say there's, um, we, we use it in, in various circumstances. If there's a tumor that's compressing the spine or say there's a uh, tumor in the brain potentially, definitely those steroids can help with uh, swelling and, and shrinking that. And so in specific cases, in short bursts, I'm all for steroids, but it, it really is case specific. Yeah. Um, talking about how quickly radiation can lead to fatigue, again, that's an individual thing, but as we look at, usually within four weeks, three to four weeks, we start to see patients being more fatigued depending on the radi where the radiation, and if you're getting chemotherapy at the same time, then it may start right away based on your counts, what your, what your blood counts are doing, it will affect your fatigue. So I don't know who asked that. So if you're experiencing that, it, it just builds up, and then as you get away from radiation therapy, it will get better. So again, keeping hydrated, exercising, do some of those things is really important. Um, I have another one about um, fatigue and exercise, and, and they say that they have been two and a half years since had breast cancer treatment, surgery, chemo, radiation, fatigue, and sometimes I can't express my thoughts. Is it related to my treatment? Um, it's not clear. It could be. If it's something that's really been a problem for you and you're experiencing more symptoms than you think you should be, you should talk to your doctor about it. Sometimes they can do MRIs to verify what's going on in your brain if there's a change that may be associated with Alzheimer's or something like that that they may be looking at. That's the only way to really look at it. If you really feel like you're, you know, you're exercising, you're eating, you're sleeping, you're doing some of the things that you can do to help prevent it, then, then it would be a good thing to talk to your doctor and see if they'd like to check up and see if there's something else going on. That may help. And exercise recommendations for cancer survivors is 30 minutes, five times a week. So really looking at cardiovascular exercise. So it's pretty aggressive. So if long term, someone asked about what, how much exercise do you have to do? It's, it's a lot. Go ahead. Sure. So um, one of the questions um, here as well is patient uh, finished chemotherapy in October and the feet are uh, numb, hot, and cold, especially at night in bed. And so the oncologist, I guess, said it can last a year or longer, uh, and what's my opinion on how long it can last? Honestly, it's, it's really it's okay. a, it is variable for different patients. Um, one of the things that I do know is that the medications which we typically use can affect how the brain perceives those signals. And so if a, um, if a neuropathy is basically how your brain is, is perceiving the signals from your feet, if you can use medications to potentially alter how the brain thinks about that or how it processes that, then that may be beneficial. And so starting medications to help with that, if you're willing to potentially um, have some adverse reactions from the medications, 
it, it, it's really once again one of those benefits versus burdens of, of treatment. And so it, it truly is, is variable. So I, I don't know that I'd have much more to add definitively on the length of time after chemotherapy. Um, there's a question about the MAP training that I talked about for fatigue and do we offer chemo brain programs in Orange County and some of those things. Um, not specifically in Orange County at this point. I know we're looking at different programs to, to provide for patients here that can do it. The other place to check out is Wellness Community and they sometimes have um, programs towards that that can help be beneficial and supplement what we can do here and they can do there. I know some other places and some other um, supportive care programs focus on this and that's a big area for their research. I know one of the places that does that, but um, there are things out there so we need to, to look at that and if someone, whoever asked this question, I have the Matt article with me I think here so I can tell you who's doing that study, where it was. The other thing we're getting is a lot of is nutritional um, supplements and again, too little calcium or vitamins, looking at that. I don't know about you, I always they have, you have to know, because you get told, you think something's low, I must be low, and calcium, I must be low, but we don't know until we do a test. And you really shouldn't take supplements, large supplements, unless we know you have a deficit. Absolutely, yeah. Sometimes what happens is, say, you're getting a, a treatment for a particular cancer, you can um, start essentially killing those cells, and sometimes you have... Uh, uh, certain electrolytes which are released into your bloodstream. And so if you're taking supplements on your own and then the chemotherapy is working in your body and that's releasing other chemicals in your bloodstream, you may potentially overdose on, on certain things. And so once again, it goes back to that. Tell your doctor everything you're taking, whether it's vitamins, supplements, herbals, and all your medications. And so um, really would, would do that on an individual basis, and, and levels definitely help to let us know right. what you need. And this is an exciting new area. I mean, nutrition is, we've all talked about it, but you know, we have naturopathic doctors now that are really more trained in nutrition and, and in supplements, and looking at that, and as we are now combining our efforts amongst disciplines, so that you know, the physicians are working with naturopathics or nutritionists and we're doing studies. We happen to have a new program here with rehab as we're starting with our STAR program, which I'm really excited about and hoping to, to start doing some of these studies that we can look at doing chemo brain studies and exercise with these specific STAR trained um, rehab physicians and, and um, professionals. So that'll be really great. So it's really a time that we're exploding. And someone asked me the question, um, uh, how close are we to a cure? And it's very exciting. I mean, if you think about how many transplants we've done and how many patients are surviving, even in the Rose Parade, to think about the few people that were on that float and it, it equaled 100 years of survival, which is really exciting as you added that up. So I can tell you, having uh, I'm around a lot of scientists in my life, there's a lot going along on, and a lot of different cancers have made big strides. So depending, I mean, if you think about, I'm teaching cancer survivorship. There was a time when you didn't think about renal kidney cancer patients having much survival or lung cancer patients having much survival, and we have that now. We have years of survival with diseases that didn't survive in the past. So we've made great strides. So be, be hopeful. It's, things are, and there's a lot of really brilliant scientists here and Caltech and UCLA and all over working together, really working together, which is exciting, pulling all these scientists together to pull that brain power and figure out how we're going to get rid of it. So we always say in my house, um, we want to be put out of business. We're hoping that as cancer healthcare providers, we can be put out of business. That's our goal. So we're getting close and it's exciting to be part of it. As old nurses that I am. <laughs> We talked a lot, I think, about how you can improve memory and thinking about it. There's some memory, um, uh, there's some memory things you can buy on the on internet. I, in fact, got some for my long. I drive a, a little bit of a distance here, so I like to do books on tape and looking at how to make your memory work and how to think about it. And even when I do a mini mental status test, I may say three things to you like book, pencil, and um, car. And then I'll talk to you and want you to remember those things and to, to make yourself do it. It's kind of yeah. Sometimes when I give that mini mental test, I get worried. I think, oh, I couldn't answer this question. <laughs> so I think it's, you know, count backwards by eight, start at 107 and caught. I think that's horrible. That's that math question again. I get nervous. 
So again, someone asked, unfortunately, can it be possible if chemo, chemo brain never goes away, is chemo brain reversible? So it's, chemo brain probably goes away whether or not there's deficits there from Alzheimer's or other cognitive changes that have nothing to do with your chemo. That I can't guarantee, and that's why we're really looking at, at assessing patients as a whole patient and really trying to look at your history and what else could be going on to make sure we're not missing it and that it isn't something like dehydration or blood counts or something simple that we can correct. So hang in there and keep working with your doctor and nurses to help them understand what's going on, and we'll try to give you pointers. And, you know, to that effect as well, if you're doing things like Sudoku or you're doing other exercises, mental exercises, otherwise, those are definitely very helpful as well. And, and the, in a sense, stronger you come to uh, the table with before you get treatments and things like that, the better you'll do afterwards. And so they have this concept of a physiologic reserve. How, how much are you able to tolerate? And so uh, definitely the more you can do and the more you try to continue to do and slowly expanding on what you're able to do all helps to minimize the impact of these things over time. You know, we, we talk a lot about individualized medicine and we're really looking at how to examine our patients so each of you are individual and we don't just say, oh, this is a breast cancer stage three, we're going to give them this. We're going to look at your age, we're going to look at your history, we're going to look at other things that, that you do or that you've done in your past, things that can affect it. And it's really important to us to really start doing more individualized um, cancer uh, treatments. So really focusing on what's important for you and what would be helpful for you so that we don't make you worse. Our goal is to give you that quality of life and give you your life. So we don't want to make it worse. And thankfully today we're more aware of, of what these chemicals can do to you and how to manage them. So very making big strides, I think. And it's, it's teamwork. It's really teamwork, all of us from our different disciplines coming together and, and working to, to make it better for you. So that's our goal. So, but we have to keep communicating. You have to keep telling us what's going on so that we can keep doing the studies. And I know we bombard you with research when you come here and say, can you, would you like to be on this study? Would you help me with this? Would you do that? And we so appreciate all your help because it does make a difference. And we do go out there and publish it. And we do go out there and educate. We've done some amazing research and, and education in nurses for end of life and palliative care training. So we have one of the biggest programs here in pain, pain resource nursing training, and we've trained many, many nurses over the years, so, and it's because of you and from your help. So thank you. Is that all the yeah. questions? Well, I want to thank everyone who asked questions this evening, and I also want to thank people who asked questions from online. We appreciate your interest in our online program, and uh, let's give our experts a big round of applause. It's good to have you. I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And if uh, you could turn your evaluations in, we would really appreciate it. And also, there will be trams coming to pick people up if you need a ride, if you parked far away. Thanks a lot. What do you call a hundred years of saving lives? At City of Hope, we call it a great beginning. We started out in 1913 in two humble tents in Duarte, California. People suffering with tuberculosis came to be treated in the fresh air of the San Gabriel Mountains. They experienced a new level of compassionate care, best expressed in the 1930s by Executive Director Samuel Golder. There is no profit in curing the body if in the process you destroy the soul. In the 1950s, with tuberculosis a thing of the past, City of Hope grew dramatically under the inspired leadership of Ben Horowitz. Known as the Architect of Hope, and an advocate for basic research. He helped transform City of Hope into a modern-day medical center dedicated to curing cancer and other life-threatening diseases. That's when the breakthroughs began to happen. Our doctors designed the cobalt bomb for treating tumors deep inside the body. It became the prototype for all other hospitals. 
When word spread of the amazing scientific discoveries going on at City of Hope, famous people came to see and lend their support. This helped raise City of Hope's profile and attract more of the world's finest doctors, scientists, nurses, and caregivers. At City of Hope, we've always felt the urgency to create new drugs and treatments in the fight against cancer and other life-threatening diseases. We have these very brilliant scientists who come up with ideas that are going to have practical applications to patients. We have our own bioproduction facility on campus. We can make all the things that we need to the highest FDA standards. It represents not just good science, but the wedding of good science with good care. The physicians and scientists who work here come to work every day to try to do something different than they did the day before. I think patients come here not for standard therapy, but for what is the future of therapy. My laboratory has actually been exploring a number of genetic approaches for treating disease, everything ranging from cancer, to HIV infection and metabolic diseases as well. More than 20 new drugs are a result of research originating at City of Hope, including four of the most frequently used cancer drugs that are saving lives all over the world. The success of City of Hope can best be expressed in human terms, in souls healed and hearts touched. For as long as I can remember, uh, I've known that there's a real relationship between mind and body. It matters to me whether a patient believes they are cared for. There's the story of Hungarian muralist John Burnett, who was treated free of charge at City of Hope. This led to his lifelong commitment, during which he painted the murals of David and Moses that grace our House of Hope. I was diagnosed with a grade 4 glioblastoma, a brain tumor. Dr. Biddy called us at our house and said, I can do this. No. And <laughs> we just cried. When you come out of buildings and you see the sign that there is always hope, and there truly is hope, and every single person there exudes that. John was two and a half when he was diagnosed. Well, the most important thing we got from City of Hope was having John healthy and, and alive and his entire life in front of him. I would describe City of Hope as a place where people go for, for treatment and receive care. There are the thousands of survivors who return to City of Hope every year for a joyful reunion that has become so successful it's standing room only. Today we are curing thousands more patients than we did a decade ago. And we're helping tens of thousands more patients than we did. But the work ahead of us is still so great. People want new options, they want better options, they want better treatments and preventions today. But we couldn't have done it alone. For 100 years, fundraising has been the foundation of our success. Good people from all walks of life have stepped up to lend their support. I was 29. Who would have thought? With the type of cancer that I had, I had a 5% chance to survive. I have a son. He's two. I know it was because of City of Hope that I'm here today, six years later. Give me It's been a hundred year legacy filled with pride and accomplishment. And the most exciting thing is, we're just getting started. <laughs>